Thank you all for coming to the uh, Institute on Ecosystems Rough Cut Seminar Series. I'm Bruce Maxwell, Director of the Institute here at MSU. We have today with us Dr. Bill Kleindl, who's going to, to talk to us about dynamic floodplains and socioecological systems. But before that, I'll say that Bill is an aquatic ecologist with a BA in uh, Botany from uh, University of Wisconsin, an MS in Urban Stream Ecology, University of Washington, and PhD in Systems Ecology from the University of Montana. Uh, he has more than 30 years of academic and consulting experience within public and private sectors in the science, policy, and management of aquatic environments, including extensive experience in the assessment, restoration, and management of degraded wetlands and rivers across multiple spatial and temporal scales. Whew. I think you did. <laughs> if I'd done it in a couple, three sentences next time. Uh, he, his current research focuses is on the shifting mosaic of riparian systems that are driven by fluvial and fire disturbances within anthropogenic landscape patches shaped by silviculture, agriculture development, and preservation management decisions. In this, in, and in this talk, he will discuss whether the portfolio effect is an efficient resource resource management tool in social ecological systems. So Bill, take it away, thanks. Thank you, thank you for that great introduction. <laughs> um, one thing I wanna point out before we even start is this line here. Uh, that's apparently a glitch that just came up and I can do my, my glitches. I've got plenty of glitches. <laughs> I'm not taking credit for this particular glitch. But I wanted to also point out some of our uh, this effort is, is moving quickly towards a paper. Um, it's part of, predominantly part of this NSF work that I'm, that I'm on with uh, force and macro systems, trying to address um, how to manage systems at, the, at continental to earth scale. Um, and part of that big question in, in, that, in that NSF grant is, is how does portfolio affect uh, connecting, how that can be implemented. The, um, but it's also funded by the uh, MSU Regulatory and Applied Economic Analysis because I find myself more and more moving towards how does e economic systems and ecosystems interact with each other. Um, the uh, uh, authors on this line is, is you know, I'm working on it with, with Frank who's here from, from the business school and Rachel who's helped me with some of the uh, statistics. And then Mark Rains, who's coming here in a couple of weeks as, as a visiting scholar funded by these folks to talk about wetlands and regulatory and recent changes in WOTUS and some other things. And then uh, also you may remember, and Dan who's helped me with trying to figure out how um, uh, on a side project on this about rational versus irrational behavior in these, these systems. But let's talk about portfolio. So, this word is, is bandied about a lot with, with, with various levels of understanding. I, I'm super good at Frisbee skills and I'm pretty good at R skills. And that's, those are the portfolio of my skills, right? Those are the things that I can shove into a satchel. And that's generally how people treat that word. And, and so this example in Alaska, we've got a, a bunch of watersheds that in each one of those watersheds has an out migration of salmon and those act as a portfolio to to support the larger salmon population. Right? That's pretty intuitive in some ways. <laughs> but it turns out uh, modern portfolio theory is a little more complicated. It was <coughs> developed by Harry Markowitz back in 1952, and, and Robert May got a hold of it and, and integrated it into ecosystem thinking in the, in the late 70s. And then Markowitz and Sharp and those guys ended up with a, with a Nobel Prize in this particular line of thinking in the in the 90s and uh, in essence it standardizes a framework of how to deal with, <coughs> with volatility or risk in the financial world and return and and why it's so important is why Markowitz and Sharp and Miller got a Nobel Prize for it is that billions of dollars have been made from this particular theory and its application uh, lots of private jets and lots of, you know, bottles of champagne have been opened through this process. But the basic tenets are that investors love return. They like to make money. And investors are, are trying to avoid risks. They don't want to have their money risky in case they have to pull their money out right away. 
and where are they in the volatility uh, component of the of the um, stock market? And that this risk and return are tightly coupled with each other. And that investors can reduce their exposure to risk and maximize their return by diversifying the assets and how the weights of those assets are are um, attributed. So I'm going to run through an example of of how this works in the stock market. So at a minimum, if you leave this room, at least you'll understand why you're 401k investors asking you how comfortable you are with risk. Whether you learn anything about ecosystems would be secondary. So, um, so this uh, uh, here's an example of three stocks: Google, IBM, and, and JP Morgan. And these are the, the returns of, of those three stocks over the last 20 years. And we can figure out the arithmetic mean of those returns by you know, add it up and taking a taking a mean of that, and come up with the idea that Google is, is has about a two percent return, and IBM is a little less than one percent, or half, and JP Morgan is less than one percent. But if you look how volatile these are, right? How wiggly these lines are, and you're me who likes to invest in stocks that are on the rise, I'm going to buy it here. I'm going to sell it here. Right. Even though this is a hot stock, it's on the rise. This is how I invest. I buy high and sell low. That's what I do. And and uh, because this ROS, this this particular stock is very volatile, that's I'm exposed to that risk. So I can um, measure the volatility by the by the standard deviations. And in finance world, they they equate the volatility with risk because the Bill Kindle investor who invests high and sells low. And so <clears throat> I go through this math and I can create this space where I know the returns and I know the volatility and I can plot these, these three stocks in that space. So the value of uh, the value of portfolio is that I can combine these stocks and their weights to try to diminish the risk while maximizing the return given the, the distribution of those things. And it's based on this, the risk of those two stocks, Google, and I, I knocked an O off the stock uh, code just to save time. Uh, Google and IBM does not equal the risk of Google plus IBM. It equals the risk of Google plus the risk of IBM, plus how those, those two stocks covariate in time. And the, the uh, formula for coming up with this, this risk is I can get the uh, deviation of the, the standard deviation of the portfolio by taking the variance of that stock plus the weight, and I decided to do a weight of 20% Google and 80% IBM up there, and the variance of IBM times the weight, plus two times the weight of Google and the weight of IBM and the standard deviation of Google and the standard deviation of IBM plus the correlation of those two. And then take the square root. So you see it says correlation and covariance, a little bit of math wizardry. When you multiply uh, standard deviation plus correlation, you get covariance. But they chose to use covariance because it's easier to understand when you try to explain it to to managers, and we'll we'll get to that in a second. So the portfolio return is the meet is the um, arithmetic mean spec return of Google times its weight plus the weight of IBM and its mean return for for uh, for that stock. And the most really important thing is those weights have to add up to one. I only have a hundred percent of my assets. I don't have or a hundred percent of my available monies. To invest, I don't have 150%. So the weights have to add up to one. And the value of this correlation components is if these things have a correlation of one, that means Google and IBM are both going up at the same time, then I'm going to fall along this line depending on, on my weight. If they if they have a perfectly negative correlation, that means every time Google goes up, IBM goes down, or vice versa, then it's going to have this distribution, and I can find a place where I can get the equal amount of work, get the distribution of weights, and have no risk because they cancel each other out. But in reality, they fall somewhere in between. So, given my weights along this correlation of zero or correlation of negative 0.5, I can choose 
to distribute my weights of IBM and Google to have this combination here, where I have less risk of both of them, but I have a little bit higher return um, because it's been it's been uh, attenuated by the Google and the, the risk and the returns of both of them, right? So if I have now if if I want to invest in 100 shares of something, so there's a bunch of assets out there, and I'm going to distribute the weights of my limited funds across those 100 shares, I would use this formula, <coughs> which is basically the, the weights of each the weight of each asset times the expected return of each asset summed up as the expected return of the portfolio. And the same thing with this, the weights of each asset plus three times the weights times their variance. Uh, standard deviation and, and correlation. And then with that, I can come up with this data cloud of potential portfolios to invest in. So if I model this with a whole bunch of different ways, I can come up with this data cloud. And this data cloud uh, configuration is pretty common in stocks. You get this sort of bullet-shaped thing. And at the outer edge of that bullet-shaped thing is this minimum variance line. And if you're Bill Kleindl again, you're going to, I don't like risk because I learned my lesson from Google. I'm going to buy this portfolio, which is a combination of weights of different stocks, and that's going to give me this return. And I'll be super happy because I limited, limited my risk. Then I'm going to go brag to my friends who are finance people, and they're like, you're a total moron. You can buy this portfolio right here and have the same uh, exposure to risk, but a much higher return. So, when they ask you that question, how comfortable are you with risk when you talk? Oh, this is the upper part of this is called the efficiency frontier. Um, <clears throat> so I want to know what are the asset returns as an investor? What are the asset weights that I can distribute? And what exactly is the risk? Kind of the same questions that I want to ask when I'm investing that we're going to get to in this ecosystem aspect. So, when you're in an, when you go talk to your 401k investor, they just want to know where you are in this risk comfort level. They're asking like, how many cigarettes do you smoke, and how often do you go hitchhiking, or you know those kind of things. So then they give you this category. Then they don't let you worry about the rest of the stuff. They say that oh, you're right about here, so we're going to invest in this optimal portfolio, not something in the suboptimal zone. Okay. These are the assumptions that modern portfolio runs under. That investors are rational and they seek to maximize their return. And that these rational agents are avoid unnecessary risk. And assets are normally distributed. So normality is a big part of this, of, of, of this analysis. And that everyone agrees on what the expected returns are. In this case, we were looking for returns of dollars, but they could be, you know, if we changed it and we were interested in happiness or green infrastructure or something like that, it would require different analysis, but same analysis, but different returns. Um, another important thing is that a single investor cannot change the market. I'm too small of a person to change the entire market about how I invest. And then there's a bunch of other stuff about taxes and dividends and loans and those sort of things that we won't get into. So, as an investor, I can choose my assets. I just made this little cartoon for my brother-in-law, so that was helpful. You can, I can choose my assets and I can choose my weights, but I cannot choose the expected return. It's the market's doing that for me. Now let's turn back to ecosystems. So we have this example of all these watersheds, but in reality, those watersheds fluctuate. They've got different disturbances. They've got landslides and fires and logging and and all sorts of other things. And that changes the out migration of each one of those salmon populations. So those salmon populations spatially are really volatile. Some are high, some are low. But the population of the salmon themselves in the Gulf of Alaska are metastable. So, and these, these are very profitable species. The individual salmon small of the streams are the assets. The population in the the meta population in the Gulf of Alaska is the portfolio. Um, this paper from uh, Petaluma, 
she, she says, okay, well, these watersheds are blinking on and off over time, and sometimes that takes hundreds and hundreds of years to see the natural range of variation to capture that kind of volatility. So how do we start to think about managing these portfolios <clears throat> to increase the uh, meta population stability through different management actions? And there's lots of analytics of people that go into this because this is a very valuable resource. So it turns out that application of, well, let me back up a step. How do, the, how do they manage this? So I wanna take a little bit of an aside and talk about ecosystem services. So we've got, in this case, the ecosystem is producing fish density. And that fish density is interacting with the opportunity to go fishing, like how many fishing boats are out there doing the um, resource extraction. And that collectively makes this, this uh, ecosystem service of commercial fishing. Then the commercial fishing produces, the ecosystem produces natural capital. It interacts with human capital through the fishing boats to, and crosses this production boundary. And then from that, it makes goods, and those goods have values, like meat and fishing boats and what have you. It also makes benefits which are harder to value in some cases. But thank you, had to read that quote. Um, the, uh, collectively, these, uh, the interaction of natural capital and human capital has a cumulative impact on the system. And that cumulative impact is managed either by reducing opportunity or increasing opportunity for fishing or increasing fish density. So that's where the management interaction comes in to, to direct the ecosystem service. So this is important because last, last year or two, this recent data I got from 2015, 2016, $12.8 billion in, in uh, seafood out of Alaska. That means from, that includes everything, including the hooks, including the, the sushi restaurants in New York, you know, including the, the rubber boots that were bought, the money that's generated from this, from this ecosystem service. So it's really important to figure out means of managing these. And then this idea of management activity portfolio, which just came up early on in this application of portfolio theory and ecosystems. That's basically managing um, access or opportunity, like how much intensive fishing can we, can we manage? So we know the out migration of the salmon in all these watersheds. We know the in migration after the fishing has occurred. We're looking for a sustainable yield by limiting where the fishing is going to, going to occur and also do work within those watersheds for restoration to try to increase the fish density, et cetera. There's other types, mix, mix assets. This is a great typology paper on portfolios and ecosystems by Matthews. He, he says there's basically six different types. There's the activity we just mentioned, there's the mixed access portfolios, and that's if I'm going out to invest uh, um, in ecosystems, I'm going to distribute my investments across ag and forestry and, and um, those other things. So I want to know how volatile those are. Harvest time portfolios. If I'm a if I'm a civicultural manager and I want to stay and I'm warehouser, I want to have a distribution of different year classes across my my uh, landscape so I can be always harvesting. Uh, uh, environmental risk management. This has a lot to do with um, invasive species. So managing for per perturbed ecosystems for some targeted uh, return, bear density or what what have you. And then genetic uh, eva environmental valuation as how, how valuable are these ecosystem services? And then genetic variation is, you know, if we only have one type of corn in America and then that corn gets a disease, we're all going to die. So you want to have a portfolio, a genetic portfolio. Um, let's go back to Pe uh, Penaluna and her, her uh, look at these watersheds because I'm proposing that there's a seven type portfolio here, a nested portfolio, to try to address not just these specific returns like salmon or logging or, you know, some tangible thing that has a market associated with it, but mostly ecosystem integrity and how that operates in portfolio. So this, the seventh type that I'm pr pr proposing is this nested portfolio. Petaluna sort of gets to it in her paper when she says, look, the ecosystems are super variable. <laughs> and in her case, she's really interested in the out migration of salmon. Considering there's there's all of the structural uh, dynamics that are occurring in the watershed, 
what is what is what does that do for the out migration of the salmon but i'm arguing that those structural elements support a wide variety of functions and services not just fish but nutrient cycling carbon sequestration megafauna habitat um, bird watching you know all those all of those things so how do those operate the way i see the world is that ecosystems are made up of a finite list of, of structural attributes those structural attributes interact in different ways to support ecosystem function some subset of that function supports human well-being and is an ecosystem service uh, i spent most of my time kind of trying to do ecological assessment where i see the interactions of these structural of structural elements and the health of those structural elements like if there's low disturbance and it's really good condition it's going to get a score of one or a 10 or 100 or high that's what the model looks like and then as it becomes more and more perturbed those the condition can decrease over time the accumulation of the condition of each one of these attributes informs what the condition of the habit of the functions are. so how do these relate to this finance system we just talked about so in this case I'm, we can equate the structural elements as assets. How those structural elements interact to support the functions, which are portfolios, the interactions of those are the weights of the assets and its effect on the portfolio. <laughs> and the asset returns is where do these where do these structural elements fall on this relationship to disturbance and condition? Okay. Um, so each one of these structural elements vary through time and covariate with each other. And they inform this you know, suite of, of functions and suites of services. So for simplicity's sake, well, geez, that's, that's, that's a joke. This is not so simple at all. It's been terrible. It's been going on for 18 months. So, um, but to focus this particular problem, I looked at one function, ecosystem habitat, habitat functions. Um, and I was really relating it to, to our larger, uh, and this is a, a case study for this larger NSF work. And the big focus of the NSF work is this second hypothesis. Ecological volatility will decrease as spatial extent increases from site to watershed in this particular study, but for that project, as we increase from, from uh, forest units, forest service units, to continent, to, to earth. Um, as I was working down this, I was stumbling across this other idea that anthropogenic simplification is a combination of lower ecological condition and lower portfolio variance. And I'm still wrestling with that. And then, then there's just general like questions that we have here. Is does modern portfolio theory help us assess and manage at large spatial and temporal scales for ecosystems and is the application meaningful does the does these does this application make sense from an ecosystems point of view rather than a particular output like salmon density point of view so here's the here's my study area this is the north fork of the flathead system and uh or this is the flathead system i'm focusing specifically in the north fork um and uh it's about 240 linear uh, kilometers of, of river and about 150 kilometers long. Canada has a lot of logging in the, in the top part. Uh, this is Glacier National Park in the United States with uh, North um, Flathead uh, Forest, National, uh, National Forest over here with mixes of exurban and ag and logging. And then down in the Kalispell Valley, there's logging up here and a lot of ag and urban at the bottom. And I went through this, the river here and divided it up into interconfluence reaches. Every time a major confluence would come on, I would define it as a reach. Define the floodplain laterally by geomorphic features, change in slope, and then added a one kilometer buffer around that. And then did a uh, time uh, dense uh, thematic maps using Landsat from 84 to 18 
and then came up with 11 land use classes across that 35 years. And then this is my simplified habitat model. I looked at uh, three different structural elements. Well, I used all the structural, the, the land cover, land cover class to come up with these three different structural components. Characteristic plants, communities of unmanaged lands, uh, a diversity of those unmanaged components, and how fragmented those unmanaged components are. And, and those related this way. First, I, I developed the condition of the buffer itself. Again, this is simple. We can talk about whether this is a good model or not. All they want, we want to, but basically how the unmanaged lands plus the diversity average, and that's average into how fragmented the condition is. Then that for the that's the condition of the buffer, and then the buffer condition is averaged into the same elements into the floodplain. So I did that by there's the nape imagery, that's what the ground looks like. Here's my 11 classes. And from those, I developed two other maps, a perturbation map of managed versus unmanaged land, and then uh, a binary map to help figure out the fragmentation component. And then gave these scores for these indices. Unmanaged lands gets a score of one. The core of those unmanaged lands gets a score of one. If uh, clear cut gets 0.5, and gets 0.25, urban gets a zero. And we can talk about these scores. They're just, they work for, for the purposes and they certainly can, we can debate them all day long about whether those scores are legitimate or not. But once I run this model, I come up with this distribution across 35 years from the valley bottom down here at site one to the to up in Canada at site 42. This is my logged, logged areas. This is essentially all the same kind of land cover types. So this mix of exurban, ag, and forest. And then here is a log, log section up near the um, near the Glacier National Park, and these are these are urban areas, urban ag areas. So that the last time I gave this talk, or last time I talked in front of you guys, um, Bruce. This was pretty much the end of the talk. This pretty much took me like, how, what do I do with this variability over time thing? I don't know what to do with it. It's rough cut, give me some ideas. Bruce gave me a great idea. He said, where's the science? And he, he left. And I, I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, well, the science is the scientific method. This is the observation part. And from the observation, develop questions. And you know, I was following the path of science. But it was very helpful, your comment. Hopefully you go have the same sort of insights in this one. So, um, <laughs> the, uh, so remember, this is how finance this is the finance component. I'm trying to figure out how we apply it to this one. What are the weights? What are the risks? And what are the returns? Applying this map to it. So when I look at the ecosystems, you can choose assets in the in the finance world, but I would argue that the assets are fixed in the ecosystem. I only have these structural elements. They're finite. I can't invent more or bring more in. If they don't exist, then they're getting a score of zero, but they still exist in the model. There's certain elements that are necessary to maintain habitat. Whether my model is correct or not is arguable, but there is a fixed number of elements that are necessary to maintain habitat. And so, and those elements are fixed. The asset returns in this case, are, I'm saying, are, are defined by the condition of those things. Uh, the portfolio return is the combination of all those conditions. The weights are also fixed because arguably you need some percentage of, of diversity and you know you need these elements and they're fixed. But what we can change in this is the returns through restoration. We'll get that in a second. Um, the portfolio risk is determined by the range of condition over time and the covariance of those components. So given all that and running this equation, we come up with this figure, which of course looks like a shotgun, but it's it's interpretable, right? So here's our valley is in green, Glacier Park and uh, the Flathead National Forest is in blue, and Canada's in orange. So <clears throat> what we see with just Glacier is we see all of that has pretty good conditions way up there on top of the on top of this figure but it ranges from low volatility to high volatility the 
the Kalispell Valley all has poor condition and also low volatility, except for this one. This is our log site. So this has poor condition, but higher volatility because it's going through logging and recovery rather than ag and always ag. These are also log sites. So the log sites cluster by low condition and high volatility. Um, the ag and urban sites cluster by low condition and low volatility. And the rest of them are clustered by high condition, but a range of volatility. So 14 up there is a confined reach without any roads, and it's mostly grass, and it's been that way for the last 35 years. It hasn't changed. There's no fires didn't affect it. No one's logging in it, no one's grazing in it. It's just natural cover next to a river. Then the river doesn't bang around because it's confined. So that's good. That's a good thing. It's supposed to do that. Over here in 12 and 26, same sort of thing. No roads, but in a broad floodplain where the river is going back and forth. So we're getting high volatility, plus a fire came through. So also good thing. So Good low volatility, good high volatility, bad low volatility, bad high volatility. Um, that's head scratcher. So going back to this first, this first hypothesis, which is an aside that I'm chewing on, not le leading towards the larger one for NSF, but <clears throat> how does how do these things inform anthropogenic simpl simplification? There's some work done by Peapock. Uh, he's from UM with uh, Vallette and Howard, some other folks. They came up with this idea that they gave a thought paper in 2015. That as landscape complexity and niche diversity are related to each other, but as landscape complexity decreases and niche diversity decreases, you get simplification of the system. And those, this paper gives lots of examples of how anthropogenic disturbance leads to the loss of those elements. And you can restore your way away from that to get back towards a more complex system. So they pre presented this idea that, that humans simplify system by a loss of these elements. So if I wanted to add in my, my work, then maybe it's not niche, niche diversity, maybe it's ecological conditions. But if we add another axis on this that talks about volatility, so as volatility decreases, we get simplified. Combined with landscape complexity decrease, and combined with niche with ecological condition decrease, then we can split these out. This is our urban ag sites that are anthropogenically simplified. This is an, a log site that is not simplified, but has lower ecological integrity. And then, how would that cloud of data fit into this three-dimensional space? to get an idea of what simplification, loss of integrity, and, and sort of ideas meshed together is that thing that I'm chewing on right now. It's the value of the rough cut. It's the rough part. So we're going to put this aside right now. This is just something I'm chewing on. But let's get back to this, this more uh, important hypothesis. It's this idea that as ecological volatility will decrease as <laughs> spatial extent increases. At the portfolio of that. So in this case, each one of these dots is the portfolio of the structural elements at the reach. Okay. So this is a portfolio of this is a, a suite of portfolios. And the blue dot is a portfolio of those portfolios. So in if you go to your investor and you invest in mutual funds, that's a port a multiple mutual funds, that's a portfolio. So the expected return is the, is the uh, model output over the 35 years for each one of these regions. The weights for this is not no longer a fixed thing, but is spatially average. So some sites that are big get more spatial weight than sites that are small. Okay. And uh, the variance or the covariance is the is the expected return over those 35 years for all of those reaches interacting with each other. That is the portfolio of the portfolio. So in this case, and this is where I'm still wrapping, trying to wrap my head around it. This is the these are the individual assets or individual portfolios. That is the portfolio of all of them 
and it does decrease our volatility for whatever that means ecologically is a question, but in terms of risk, this is the part I'm still struggling with. I'm struggling with this thing for weeks and weeks, and I'm struggling with it in front of me right now. What does risk mean in terms of ecosystems? This is a decreased volatility in Portfolio. Okay. Now, what I did was I did I split up the river linearly into uh, chunks of five. Being clever, I said let's cut it into 45 um, cuts, which makes 46 reaches. I want to do it by five, but I'm bad at math. Every time I say I'm bad at math, like a rage and she just laughs and nods. Um, so, so, uh, uh, so what you're about to see is I went from 45 or 46 to 41 to 36 to 31 all the way down to two and then ran this ran the um condition scores and the portfolios for each reach and then and then put those into portfolio in blue so what you see is this changes spatially is we don't decrease this at the decrease of spatial extent um the volatility decreases the spatial extent increases so in this case the spatial extent is increasing but my volatility is also increasing it's the opposite of what we thought it was going to be. And that sort of makes sense when you think about it, because the, the valley bottoms that were very low volatility are massive watersheds. They're really wide. Even though it's split up evenly, linearly up the river, they're really wide down there. So they had a big driver. But as, as those guys got attenuated increase in space, then the increased volatility of the other ones brought that volatility level up. So our volatility is increasing as we increase in, in space. I don't know what that means for management. We're still trying, I'm still trying to wrestle with that idea. But let's get to these last two questions. So, um, uh, does modern portfolio theory help assess and manage large landscapes and large temporal scales? I think the assessment thing is important because when, when we get into that, all those barn and whisker graphs, uh, it's really hard to provide that to a manager and say, what does this mean for your watershed over this time with this big range? By putting that into that uh, condition volatility space, I think it's really informative for what the, what the ecological condition of the river is at whatever scales. But this particular figure is what happens when we combine, and this, in this case, this would be forests. So if we've got forests that are public lands, wilderness, and industrial forests. And these are the ecosystem services that are being managed for. You can see that all the production forests are managed for wood production, right? They all look like that. The wilderness areas are managed for everything else but wood production. But the land of many uses are managed for different things depending on what the priorities are. And I have bare versus carbon because of that paper that's referenced there. We propose that what happens when we look at uh, Yukon to Yellowstone and it's managed for um, megafauna, uh, it's managed for megafauna. So the managers are constructing a landscape that's set up with edge and, and with core burned areas and all sorts of things that can support this wide variety of habitat. Then we look at West Carb, which is another initiative that goes from California to Alaska and that's managed for carbon sequestration. Those managers are managing that landscape to set it up for in a completely different way. They're looking at row crops of cottonwood because they put in a lot of carbon, but that's not what, that's not what megafauna want. So there's two different major initiatives with two different end goals. So in this case, do I get to it? Yes, I do right here. So back to our, our stock investors, they're rational agents, right? They can assign the assets and the weights, and then with that, they can decrease this, eliminate this risk through diversity, recognizing that there's undiversifiable systematic risk in the system. So they try to reduce down to that so you get to a place where you just can't avoid some kind of risk. They're making rational decisions. Arguably, the people that are managing salmon and then are managing uh, harvest timing for forests they're also making rational decisions that are doing this exact same thing, reducing risk down to some point where they can't reduce it any further. But um, 
the uh, the question about whether those resource managements are acting rational or not, or whether the whole ecosystem and the resource managers are the social ecological system is rational. Um, I pre pre proposed this earlier that they that these re that first off ecosystems, and I'm really struggling with this. Talked with some of my ecologist friends. They're, they argue that ecosystems are hyper rational ecosystems themselves because they have to obey the laws of thermodynamics and that they they make they follow a path but re, but resource managers are the vector for irrationality okay but they're like they operate in two different modes they're making rational decisions to manage for logs or for salmon but they're not accounting for externalities that make their decisions irrational for other things so they're like quantum rational. Okay. Great, I just made up. I didn't make it up, it's on the next slide. But uh, the, uh, uh, in this case, we, they, we would arguably whether they can control the assets of weights. I'm still trying to struggle with that language. As I said, my friend Mark is coming to town in a couple of weeks to give this talk. He's on the thing, we're gonna pound this out and get this thing published, but we'll, we'll work out this language. But so is it ecologically meaningful? <laughs> Here's this. This efficiency frontier, low risk, low return, medium risk, medium return, high risk, high return. This is the kind of decisions we just talked about with the example. But when you look at that, at that first figure I showed you, that shotgun figure, it, it more looks like this. And I think it tickles at the edge of the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, which I see as the brass ring in ecology. It's like hard to, it's hard to, to uh, quantify and it's hard to get a hold of, but everybody wants, everybody wants it, right? But I think what we see if this intermediate disturbance hypothesis is distribution is applied to this portfolio for that previous figure, there is a place where there's low volatility or low return and high volatility and low return and low volatility. And then there's this intermediate space up here where arguably we want to be. So the efficiency frontier and how you would choose the portfolio would look more like this rather than, than what finance uh, how finance sees it. Um, so just to recap, ecosystems in in uh, in finances they they follow these assumptions <laughs> that the rat the the agents that want to buy the stock want the highest return and they're rational. The rational agents that want to avoid risk that the assets are normally distributed that everyone agrees on what the returns are going to be. So they're all focused on salmon or board feet or dollars and that a single investor can't change the market and there's the other things that you know think about but in ecosystems at least this type 7 nested portfolio um ecosystems are hyper rational but managers are quantum rational right depending on whether they account for externalities or not the uh the what the the return is conditioned and we want to maximize condition we just Kind of define that edge. Um, ecosystems require volatility to be healthy, but how much volatility? If you're going to manage for that, what the risk is, it's not reduced volatility, it's a perfect volatility. Uh, that the data is normally distributed, which I am still struggling with and trying to figure out, right? There's some problems with normality with this data. And then the resource management, resource managers can do restoration that influences the return. They can influence the market, that they can't influence the market in, in finance, but they can influence the market in ecosystems by doing ecological restoration to increase the return of the assets. And, uh, and then where is the efficiency frontier in this multi-nested portfolio? Like, but ultimately, it's, it comes down to this, right? So if we want to manage the systems and combine these, this economic, ecological interaction, we've got to be able to speak that language, especially in what's trending towards a low regulatory environment. So how's that? At 15 minutes or so. Yeah. Remind me, where was, where was the evidence for that, that 
efficiency criteria that you had there from the the, the intermediate disturbance yeah, hypothesis. The distribution was actually had like a marsh bunch of there. Well, in the in the the finance data, you get that cloud that you can just draw that line on a, a bullet. Yeah. But that didn't have a. This doesn't have a bullet, but I'm arguing that it looks if you were to draw a line around this thing, it would go like it would be an arc, or if you put a nonlinear regression, it would be an arc, and that arc maybe yeah intermediate disturbance hypothesis. I mean, it fits the type of description. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, if you think about like a stream reach, you had stream reach that was undisturbed, really good condition. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on how you define volatility. But if the only volatility is from, say, blowdowns and fires and things like that, which you could look at and say, well, those are natural processes that are kind of a system that adapted to it, is what you want to. I don't really think of those as being bad events. Um, you look at that and you say, well, every year I would give that stretch a, 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 a score, a pretty high score. Yeah, it's pretty much site 26. Right. So, yeah. so the point is that it, that site, those sites that are undisturbed, are going to tend to have low volatility and high expected condition. Right. Which makes me think that the frontier is isn't going to curve down on the left hand side necessarily it could kind of keep going up until it hits the, the, you know the great place that's always great yeah well i i think it's it, i mean if you think about where all the uncertainty lies in this thing which there's plenty of vectors for it the the habitat model itself weighs the top of this kind of course we this graph mm -hmm. um the way it's designed right now, volatility can be measured by um, uh, changes in land use or changes in cover, like diversity. So the way you just described is this is fire and river moving. That's that's just shrubs. That's been shrubs for 35 years. Mm -hmm. They're both in really good condition. But you know, this has no volatility because it's locked up. It's right. egg to the river's edge. And River doesn't move. It's armored. Well, this is we get lots of lots of cuts and lots of recovery, lots of growth. So the, the vectors are different. The, the, there's an issue with the analogy between financial risk from an asset and what volatility. There is an issue. We, we tend to think yes. that financial risk is a bad thing. Yes. This Whereas is in your model, volatility is not necessarily right. right thing. And this has led to very long walks in the woods to figure out the <laughs> difference between those two words. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So uh, that's what I'm struggling with. What is what is risk in this case? For sure. Yeah. Kind of along the thinking back on those lines, I'm sort of struggling with reconciling the supposition that the assets and returns are fixed and accounting for the volunteer uh, volatility uh, in, I mean the nature of an ecosystem is change so how do you how do you arrive at the notion that, it's, that the assets are fixed well that because in this case there there is core forest or core unmanaged land that is the asset core unmanaged land is a thing that that's what we want to measure. So even in ag areas, the core of unmanaged land was core zero. So it's still part of the habitat model. It just has been removed from urban influence. So that asset doesn't change, but the volatile, those things are volatile internally. So the returns change. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just had a question about the analogy with the return as well. Um, because it seems like, and I'm not a finance expert, but um, Financial perspective, it's dollars increasing dollars is that. But for each of these different land uses, um, habitat, expected condition is gonna is gonna be different. Is that, I mean, is, is that return? Return would be the condition of how healthy. Yeah. Oh, so, so if you were at a hundred percent and your 
your return is maxed. So it's not how many trees are being harvested or no. how many ag products. The south how much the system. Wildlife is being conserved. Okay. Because those seem like three different. Yeah, that's Thanks. so. Ultimately, they'll be. I'll run this for habitat and for silviculture and for um, carbon sequestration to see how each one of those things and those will act as mutual funds or sectors in the you know sectors in the finance sectors and how those interact with each other. So first is trying to just work out the problems with what's risk in. You know, portfolio concept, what's risk of ecosystem, different words. So, definitely struggling with language, but once the language is sort of figured out, then we'll see how these, what happens when I maximize my forest management? What happens to carbon sequestration of birds or megafauna? They, they start to, they'll, they'll respond in different ways. So, quick note, and then a question like Barrett versus carbon, of course, carbon. Right, you're gonna back me on that, and then number two is like I love it that you're on this sort of knife edge, disciplinary knife edge, right? And you're looking off in the distance, you know, reviewing your ecological background, but then you're getting a little glimmer of what it's like to sort of check out this economics landscape. And I guess I'm wondering if you had a peak, if there's been like a little light that has shown its way to you that says, Oh my god, I could do the same thing to be making a thousand to ten thousand to a million times more per hour. <laughs> the math's not that hard. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, in the in the finance stuff. Yeah, okay. yeah. I don't have the right clothes. <laughs> well, Bill, first I I appreciate you embracing the rough and the rough cut, um, and I and I really enjoyed the fact that you um, one one of my initial concerns as you were going along was that scale dependence space scale but you, you did a nice job of, of examining that at least you didn't ever examine the time scale piece so varying the time scale seems to me could be pretty important in terms of how it changes that distribution yeah so to get volatility to get that temporal density it's hard like you only get 35 years because of landsat so land so if i use landsat then that by automatically that makes my resolution limited. So, um, but is it res? Excuse me, but is it resolution limited uh, because of the the time scale that you know certain processes are occurring and yeah, you just yeah. can't possibly capture those? But that that in itself seems like that's going to be continue to be a big limitation oh, to sure. your. Yeah. Your assessment because some of those processes are much. If you were to look longer. at, if you were to look at that, that I mean, if, if if you talk to people about what is the natural range of variation, that's like you can't see that unless you can see it for 500 years. So you won't know that. But arguably, this would be contemporary range of variation because we've changed the world a lot since 1984. Um, I I think there also might be problems when I move this to forest that. 1984 it's a forest and in 2018 it's also a forest so it's going to be like no fun no no kind of volatility that you can get into that could you parse the temporal resolution same with the spatial resolution no yeah <laughs> well the the way those came you stand, you change the temporal yeah standard well, or resolution and then at least see how the cloud moves up. right the way the covariance and the standard deviation was came out of the, all 35 years uh, yeah I mean, I could split it up by 10-year chunks and to see if, like, climate change is a driver, that would be an interesting way of looking at that. It still might be too little. It still might be too little. I mean, that's the problem with this temporal density. With with stocks, it's like second by second. Like, you can go grab 20 years and have just a like a unbelievable amount of numbers. But uh, with Landsat, you know, or with remote sensing. I mean, it does. It's definitely limited. Maybe there's another metric habitat mission. Well, yeah. The next thing I'm going to do is send these these uh, um, land cover types to some folks at NTSG, which have built an NPP model based on the outputs of the land cover, and then we'll see the volatility of the right. of the um, NPP over time. 
but still I'm limited to 84 and a half. I'm also limited by my ability to be a good remote sensor. God, I tell you what, I found a mistake because I wrote R1 instead of R2 like a year ago. <laughs> you see a grown man cry. That was, that was it. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Right, any more questions? Thank you all for coming.